this episode on Make Something Wonderful, Steve Jobs in his own words. It was released last week, maybe two weeks ago. I think it was just last week though, by the Steve Jobs archive. They put this together and then, yeah, it is this compilation of different things that Steve Jobs wrote or transcriptions of different speeches he gave. It does just go through it. It's a biography going through, yeah, his early childhood all the way through. And then one of my favorite things in it, and I'll talk about that, is this section where they collected different emails that he wrote to himself as he pieces together his speech for Stanford, the Stanford commencement speech. One of the best commencement speeches. My one fun fact, I guess like somewhat topical and very niche. So if you follow Ramit Sethi, he wrote the book, I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Then he finally started a podcast a couple of years ago. I say finally because he was pretty much perfect for having his own podcast, but he just never did it. That became very popular. And now he has this Netflix show, which I think is like top 10, maybe worldwide, but at least in the US right now about, I think it is, is it called How to Get Rich? Anyway, he has this fun fact that he was in the audience for that speech, for the Stanford commencement speech, that he was graduating that year and was able to see that in person. And he mentioned it off just as a side comment in some interview. I can't even remember which one it is, but great commencement speech. It has the idea of you can only connect the dots looking backwards and yeah, this book does a great job of connecting different dots and yes, Steve Jobs in his own words. One of the first quotes here is he just talks about growing up in Silicon Valley. He says, my parents moved from San Francisco to Mountain View when I was five. My dad got transferred and that was right in the heart of Silicon Valley. So there were engineers all around. Silicon Valley for the most part at that time was still orchards, apricot orchards and prune orchards. And it was really paradise. I remember almost every day air being crystal clear, where you could see from one end of the valley to the other. It was really the most wonderful place in the world to grow up. This goes to, I guess the theme here would be similar to like Mastery or Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, that Steve Jobs grew up in exactly the place you would want to be if you are trying to get into electronics and then eventually into computers. And I think he doesn't really, he doesn't take that for granted that he had great parents that, and grew up in an environment that uh, was supportive of what would turn out to be his interest. And he talks about a neighbor nearby that his dad was a builder, worked with his hands, had a workshop and gave Steve Jobs his, I guess I'll just keep, I'll just say Steve, we're on first name basis now that I'm doing this podcast that he gave him a workbench and then his dad, like he, he could look at him as a model of someone who built stuff. And it wasn't electronics that his dad's expertise was in, but he taught him to disassemble, reassemble, break things apart, put them back together, really see how things get put together. And then it was one of the neighbors, he says, there was a man down the street who was into electronics and would have these different kits around, different electronics around. And he says here, yeah, me putting like one of these kits together, he says, it gave one an understanding of what was inside a finished product and how it worked because it would include a theory of operation. But maybe even more importantly, it gave one the sense that one could build things that one saw around oneself in the universe. These things were not mysteries anymore. That's the end of the quote. And this is starting to get to that idea that you want to create these things that seem like magic, but you have like to get there, you have to understand how it works. And then sometimes like even when the real magic is that even when you understand how it works, it still can be super useful, still can seem like magic. And sometimes that is the same thing with great entertainment also that you can understand storytelling. You can understand, say like pro wrestling is fake and still be entertained by it if they're doing a great job of it. And what this really reminds me of in my own personal experience was I studied electrical engineering. I took a, I'm not, anyway, we won't talk about my performance in school, but 
I took, I, I remember taking this wireless communications class, learning how, say, like wireless internet works, like down to the ones and zeros. But no matter what, every time I stop to think like how amazing that is, yeah, I'm just kind of blown away that we're able to get internet anywhere. It's all like you can just be online all the time and it's just in the air, passing through our bodies and passing through walls and all that. Not necessarily a mystery how it works, but it does always still seem magical. Then the next thing as far as connecting the dots, looking backwards, he there's a section, a uh, paragraph where he, they talk about him and returning to California after he had left for college for a few months. And he says, I didn't really realize how different California was than the middle of America, and even to some extent, the East Coast, until I traveled to those places. This is, yeah, like he appreciated his upbringing in California, and then probably even more so appreciated it, coming back to it, when you realize, oh, it's hard to realize that you have this a good environment until you leave it and realize, oh, there's actually like worse environments that you can be in. And you just don't know what you don't know until you leave. Then he talks about school and he says he wanted to do two things. I wanted, from the book, he says, I wanted to read books because I loved reading books and I wanted to go outside and chase butterflies. Do things that five-year-olds like to do. Just, I guess, like here, just want to talk about. He, he did love reading books. Then let's see. I'm going to jump to, not yet to the Stanford speech, but uh, a few quotes. I'm still reading the book, actually. So I'm, I'm about, I'll, I'll do multiple parts of this podcast. Probably like two. We'll see how that goes. I was supposed to do with Wally physical 100, like five parts that we planned out, outlined, and then didn't do. But I, I'll do a second one of this for the Steve Jobs book. Speaking about Steve Wozniak, he says, we're two planets in our own orbits that every so often intersect each other. There's a bond there that will last as long as we both live. And he talks about that where he's looking back. Let me see. Oh yeah, here we go. I found the quote. He says, I remember talking to Woz and saying, we may fail, but we have no responsibility now. No wives, no kids, no house payments, nothing. If we don't do this now, we never will. We have nothing to lose. The worst we'll get out of this is that we'll have the memories of having gone for it. And that's the end of the quote. And that connects to putting the dots together. That back then he was able to like project forward and look back on, at least we'll have the memories, that sort of thing. That And it reminds me of Sam Altman. He has this article about how to succeed. He is uh, the founder of OpenAI and previously was president of Y Combinator. So Sam Altman, in that article, a great, great article, he, or like blog post, he says, hard work compounds and what you want to, that's why it's important to do it early. If you're going to pick a phase in your life to work hard your career, it makes sense to just do it as early as possible because that hard work compounds. In the most obvious way, it's, pro it's with the financial success because the most common example of compounding is fine financially. So that if you can make that money early, invest it, then that will compound very straightforward. But then there are other, there are other, other things that compound. So the learning that you do early on will compound. You'll be able to, if you're able to work hard at learning something, then that makes it easier to either combine that skill with an intersection as you learn other things or just use that to learn other things more quickly or more deeply. And then the other way that it compounds is just through relationships that you build, that building really good relationships early, building your network early is going to compound through your career. If you do it early on, then you meet people who then will also grow in their careers. And then that's the best way to connect with people super successful <laughs> who become unreachable is to connect with them earlier on. And that's why this idea of doing the hard work early, and if anything, you have the memories, is, is always something useful. But yeah, going back to these other quotes after college, so starting Apple, he says, it turned out that it took maybe 50 hours to build one of these things by hand. So this was the first Macintosh. It was taking up all of our spare time because our friends were not that skilled at building them. So Waz and I were building them for them. 
We thought if we could just get what's called a printed circuit board, where you could just plug in the parts instead of having to hand wire the whole thing, we could cut the assembly time down from maybe 50 hours to more like an hour. Waz sold his HP calculator and I sold my VW microbus and we got enough money together to pay someone else to design one of these printed circuit boards for us. That's the end of the quote. Yeah, just thought, thought it was funny like they that he sold his VW microbus to get a circuit board. And then that kicked things off. And another thing about this book is it has these great photos, just a bunch of different photos throughout his life. One of them is this briefcase, and then it opens up, and there's uh, the circuit board with some keyboards, or with a keyboard. It looks very much like how, what you would take to hijack a plane in the 70s, but it is one of the early, I guess maybe it's a prototype of the Apple One. So it's a custom Apple One setup is what it says. Next quote, and it's the exact same way with a computer. It can do about a million instructions per second, and so we tend to think there's something magical going on, when in reality, it's just a series of simple instructions. So this is from, he's talking to, I forget what audience this is, but he's explaining how, how a computer works. And what it's really doing under, under the hood is, in a way, very dumb. It's just able to do very simple calculations extremely fast. And then he compares that to if you were, uh, you are a human. And... You could follow a couple instructions, snap your fingers, or go to the flower shop and return and then snap your fingers again. But you're able to do it a million times in a second. Then if you can do that, switch it out for very small calculations, those can work together. And then you're able to do anything that you can do with a computer today. Now project it out a few decades in the forward, uh, a few decades forward. I wrote down here that this also reminds me, this, I guess it's an ana analogy here that there's this writer, Steph Smith, so she's a podcaster also, and she has this blog post. One of the better ones, it's, it's just the whole idea is in the title of that. The, the article is great too, but it's this idea that to be great, all you have to do is be good for an extended amount of time. And I wrote that to relate to this, that it's not magic how a computer works. It's able to do a series of simple instructions, just able to do that a lot. And with being great at something, Oftentimes, it's pretty simple what you need to do to accomplish that. To be a great writer, you need to write and get feedback and improve it uh, a little bit. And it doesn't have to be greatness every single time, especially like the drafts. So very simple. Just keep writing, improve a little bit, do that for an extended amount of time, be merely good for a long time, you'll be great. The next quote here, he says, by 1986, 1987, pick a year. People are going to spend more time interacting with these machines than they do interacting with automobiles today. People are going to be spending two, three hours a day interacting with these machines longer than they spend in the car. That's the end of the quote. And I wish it was two, three hours a day. And what I wrote was by 2023, people are going to be spending two, three quarters of their day interacting with these machines. Collectively, two, th two thirds of your waking life at a computer, looking at glass screens. It, that was one of the things with iPhone when, well, I forget which iOS it was, but maybe, uh, I was going to say two years ago now, but it's probably five or six years ago now, when screen time came out and you were able to actually look how long you use your phone every day, how many times you pick it up, how long you're in different apps. And it was, in a way, I'm sure a lot of people estimated pretty high and were still blown away by like actually how much they end up using their phones. I know I was, and I've done every, tried every different thing to break any sort of addiction to my phone. I'm okay with it. I'm not, I actually, I'm, I'm pretty, yeah, I would say okay. I still check it all the time. You just end up like, you block all the other apps, and then the ones that remain become addicting. <laughs> like, I only have a few things available on my phone, so like, I'll just check Gmail all the time, because maybe something will come in through. But yeah, I just don't really have a lot of social media on my phone and have tried to replace it with read why like book highlights kindle and it does turn into like whatever remains it is in a way the phone that's addicting rather than any individual app but definitely it would be way more addicting with anytime i have twitter on my phone that that's probably the bottom, <laughs> bottom of, of things as far as how high i can get interacting with a piece of glass so the next 
quote here. Again, he says just about books since I want to continue to do like book note podcast episodes. He says, when I was going to school, I had a few great teachers and a lot of mediocre teachers. And the thing that probably kept me out of jail was the books. I, I could go and read what Aristotle or Plato wrote without an intermediary in the way, and a book was a phenomenal thing. It got right from the source to the destination without anything in the middle. That's the end of the quote. And yeah, it's just a reminder of how, how amazing books are, that they just are able to capture all the like decades of someone's knowledge and then compress it into something that you can buy for $10, $15. It's great. Good books. Good books are amazing. And then further on, he says, the problem was you can't ask Aristotle a question. And I think as we look towards the next 50 to 100 years, if we really can come up with these machines that can capture an underlying spirit or an underlying set of principles or an underlying way of looking at the world, then when the next Aristotle comes around, maybe if he carries around one of these machines with him his whole life, his or her whole life, and types in all this stuff, then maybe someday after this person's dead and gone, we can ask this machine, hey, what would Aristotle have said? What about this? And maybe we won't get the right answer, but maybe we will. And that's really exciting to me. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing. That's the end of the quote. Of course, right now, ChatGPT has dominated the headlines for, or at least like tech headlines, for the past few months. One of the bigger ones that was somewhat mainstream was when someone released like a Steve Jobs appearance on, he was being interviewed by Joe Rogan. And it is this thing where Steve Jobs basically carried one of these around all the time. And that's what this book is. It's just, it's a compilation of different words he wrote or said somewhere. And then, yeah, if you think about in the next 50 years, like what a great, whoever the next Aristotle is. Yeah. If they're writing this all down, it's being captured somewhere, then you really will be able to capture their worldview and personality, at least as it comes across in writing and then be able to ask that a question. I, <laughs> I, I use this app called Descript and it's always had this voice overdubs where you can train a model to sound like yourself. I think I'm about to do it, but I wish I held, I wish I did it earlier, but also I was like holding off. For whatever reason, I don't know. Because I think they've, they've had it for three or four years that it was this feature has been available. I haven't done it yet, but I've also been tempted. I've seen like blog posts where people upload like their entire archive of journals and then are able to ask their past selves something. I would die of cringe before before I would be able to you know upload all of that. Maybe someday I'll do that. I, I do have just like pages and pages. I mean, I... I don't doubt that I've written, say, maybe like a million words is a lot, but yeah, definitely like hundreds of thousands of words journaling. I don't know that it would be much different from, I'd probably, it's probably going to say, oh, I want to lose weight and be able to focus. Anyway, okay. Uh, the next quote here is about Apple's strategy. He says, now Apple's strategy is really simple. What we want to do is put an incredibly great computer in a book that you carry around with you and you can learn how to use in 20 minutes. That's what we want to do. And we want to do it this decade. And we really want to do it with a radio link in it so you don't have to hook up to any. You're in communications with all these larger databases and other computers. We don't know how to do that. Now. It's impossible technically. That's the end of the quote. And they achieved this, of course, and then went even beyond it to where it's, oh no, it's, it's literally in everybody's pocket now. Um, not within that decade, but of course, uh, a few decades after. And it had the, <laughs> not quite a radio link, but in spirit, the same thing. So that you could connect to databases, computers, everywhere. Everyone was connected. And and yeah, it's interesting to see his, his he was already thinking about, like, oh, I need to make something that's easy to learn. And that was always like a goal, a through line through all the products. That he did. Then the next quote, here is about, it's this analogy to where he's comparing the Macintosh and IBM PCs. He says, we're in the exact, the same exact parallel situation today. Some people are saying we need to put an IBM PC. Actually, hold on. I'm going to go backwards. I just a paragraph back. He says, so fortunately in the 1870s, Alexander Graham Bell filed the patents for the telephone. Another radical breakthrough in communications that performed basically the same function but people already knew how to use it. The neatest thing about it was that 
in addition to allowing you to communicate with just words, it allowed you to sing. It allowed you to intone your words with meaning beyond the simple linguistics. Now, that's the end of that part of the quote, but <laughs> that does remind me of like, then, oops, that does remind me that then, of course, like with the iPhone, texting became more popular probably than phone calls and is still like way more popular than phone call or even more popular than ever compared to phone calls. And it takes away this idea of intoning your words with meaning beyond the simple linguistics. So we have to use things like emoji and uh, return to that. Or some people do just send voice messages and that sort of thing. But back to this idea, this quote, he says, we're in the same exact parallel situation today. Some people are saying we need to put an IBM PC on every desk in America to improve productivity, but it won't work. The special incantations you have to learn this time are slash Q and things like that. Most people are not going to learn slash QZs any more than they're going to learn Morse code. And that's that idea. Yeah, if you put a telegraph with Morse code on everybody's desk, that doesn't connect everybody until everybody's able to learn Morse code, which would never happen. And yeah, I wanted to note this. I hadn't heard this analogy before of Morse code to being IBM PCs. And then, yeah, of course, as I just mentioned, ChatGPT, some people have described it as the first time that people can program by just speaking in English or in their native language. And yeah, by to program without programming and not necessarily with no code tooling, but with actually, yeah, doing speaking and then it's doing something. And yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see what the future holds for that. So getting back to the section about the Stanford speech, as I mentioned, he drafted a bunch of it by writing emails to himself. And then you can see all a few different emails, see what made it into the speech and what didn't. In one draft, like one of the first emails he wrote to himself, he was just, these were the four things. So one of them, were it was one habit, number two, what to eat. Number three, curiosity, and number four was what he was doing when he was 20 years old. Going through those, number one, habits are powerful, and the habits he would suggest are meditate for 20 minutes a day, and then walk to work. And then he does this calculation that if you walk to work and back, that's 30 minutes each way, so an hour a day. And then he does five days a week, 250 hours a year for 20 years is 5,000 hours. And then he says like 10 hours a day. Basically, he gets to this math of it's about, it's more than one year of just walking if you add that all up. Yeah, one year of your waking life. Then I like that. Of course, I've been trying to walk more. I've been, I have been trying to do 10,000 steps a day. The, I guess it's cliche, but I, I think it was like really popular five years ago. And I think it's like gaining popularity again. What I haven't started doing, well, I, I haven't been meditating. What I do sometimes is I'll air quotes, meditate, but fall asleep for 15 minutes. I always do want to try to meditate for, yeah, just see how, how it goes. If I can do it and continue to do it for an extended period of time, it, it seems like one of those that you don't feel the immediate benefit and it can take a while, but it's totally worth it. Someday I hope to experience that. Number two, he says, yeah, you, you are what you eat. And he suggests also fasting one day per week. Then number three, curiosity. He says, what is miraculous is all around us. This is uh, a quote from the autobiography of a yogi. But I think it's of, of two things where Apple made what seemed to be like, maybe not miraculous, but like magical. I, maybe they're the same thing, but magical products that uh, who knows if you gave someone an iPhone, a connected iPhone 20 years ago, it would seem magic. Internet, Yeah, just what you're able to do with, with a computer these days is pretty miraculous. But this is more about that. It's not about those products. It's about the day to day and that everything is miraculous in a lot of ways that you can go to a store and there's food. And now we try to make everything available with a few taps. The other part, of the thing that happened yesterday, I was just watching this video. It's like, yeah, I watch a lot of dog videos these days. If I am like using social media, it's a lot of dog videos. One of them was just about, oh, if you don't want to walk your dog, just imagine you were 80 years old, how much you would pay to like return to this moment when you're younger, your dog is alive. And yeah, just thinking about that and 
this relationship I have with Booster is miraculous and something I'm, I'm grateful for. I've been trying to take her on hikes. Last week, I took her on a hike a day for a full week. I think this would align with Steve Jobs' <laughs> guidance about walking every day and appreciating what's, ma- what's miraculous that's all around us. And I've try- I-, I think my goal will be to try to take her on three hikes a week if I can. There's one really near us. And that's a nice like three mile loop. Yeah. And then number four, when he talks about what he was doing when he was 20 years old, he says, when I was 20 years old, I took classes here just as Apple was getting started. Then I guess one more thing from, yeah, from the commencement speech section, he says, you can't plan to meet the people who will change your life. I am invited to speak at Stanford's business school once or twice a year, and I always try to do it. I had accepted an invitation to speak one Thursday late in the afternoon, and I wasn't feeling very well. And I had a dinner later that evening with some important customers up at a winery on Page Mill Road. That's the end of the quote. And then he goes on to say he did end up going to the talk. Before he stood up to speak, he was sitting next to, he says, it didn't take me long to notice this really cute girl sitting next to me. And yeah, eventually he finishes that, then catches up to her in the parking lot asks her to go have dinner on Saturday. She says yes and gives her phone number. Then he says, as I was walking to my car, I asked myself, if this was the last day of my life, would I rather have dinner with important customers or her? I raced back to her car just as she was about to drive off and I asked her, how about dinner tonight? She said, sure. And we were married 18 months later. That's the end of the quote. And it is just this idea of jumping at an opportunity when you have it and also that you cannot he, he wouldn't have been able to connect that dot from like looking for it if i give this speech at stanford then i'm going to meet my future wife that was not what he had in mind and what i wrote down here just as a note was this case for and against hell yeah or no so hell yeah or no is this uh sort of Framework, I don't know that framework is the word, but just like this. Anyway, it's, I, I like the idea behind it that Derek Sivers wrote. He has this good blog post called Hell Yeah or No. Basically that a lot of us just end up doing a bunch of stuff we're not super into. And you can eliminate those things and only do the things that are hell yeah when you think about it. Then you are able to fill your life with things that energize you. And yeah, it's in line with a lot of different books, 80-20 principle and essentialism that you, your life should just be like things that are your hell yeah about. And maybe this is something I've changed my mind about. Like I, I was all in probably a hundred percent into that, but now I would say it depends. And I would say that you want like earlier on, you need to, I, you need to calibrate the hell yeah compass that you have because do it too early, or too early you just won't do a lot of things. <laughs> I think like when you're younger, Say yes to a lot of different things because you, you actually don't know that you won't like certain things. And then it is this thing of how many, I'm guessing more than, or at, le- at least a handful of people who, couples, married couples, or people in, that have been in relationships for a long time who met, you know, they, by chance, it wasn't like at least one of them was probably at some, it's some situation where at least one person wasn't, was at the event and, didn't really feel like going to it or didn't know it was just random that they happened to be there. And yeah, a lot of good things can happen if you go to things where you only want to go to it. Like like he said, for this speech at Stanford Business School, he said, I wasn't feeling very well. And he had somewhere else to be. If you're really going to say hell yeah or no, and you say no to something, your alternative better be like a hell yeah that you're, are you really saying hell yeah to staying home? And I don't know what else. Like, I, I like to think sometimes about like, I had a day off today. What should I do? I don't know that I spent it in the best way possible. Actually, I didn't because I, I spent like a few hours just on my computer and it was just like any other day. I was just on my computer, like browsing, killing time, um, trying to write and somewhat like wasting time. And that's when I decided, okay, I needed to go on a hike or do something like that. And I also was thinking, oh, which hike should I do? And then I decided, okay, you know what? I have a day off. I need to go and do something that I wouldn't do on just a normal weekday. And you have to balance it because sometimes, yeah, staying home actually is a hell yeah. 
I love staying home too and watching some shows, watching some StarCraft, whatever it is. Anyway, this has gone on pretty long. Thanks for listening. Get this book. It's free. It's the best price. Make something wonderful, Steve Jobs, in his own words. I'm sure if you Google it, it'll be the first result to download it or just go into like iBooks. They also provide uh, different versions or like different formats. You're able to download one that'll work on your uh, Kindle, whatever it is. And I'm going to do another episode on this once I finish the book. I'm about maybe 30%, maybe 40% through. Yeah, thanks for listening.